Good morning and Sasrika Sarenu. My name is Justina Ajla and I'm so grateful to be here today. What a wonderful start to my day and it is still the daytime. I'm on the West Coast. I'm a second generation settler of Punjabi ancestry, born and raised on the Tsleil-Waututh, Stolo and Musqueam territories, also known as Vancouver, BC. And while I'm blessed to have grown up in such a quiet and calm community, it would be disingenuous to identify it as home without acknowledging the history and the people who this land truly belongs to. I'm aware of the opportunity I have to be an active and curious learner and, and bring my learnings to my family members and members of this community who do not know about the history of these lands. Kitsilano takes its name after a Squamish First Nations chief whose people were displaced by local government in 1901. At the time, this area was a dense forest, but an attractive one to occupy due to its flat land, proximity to train and water, and the prospective popularity of Vancouver as a city. The story of the Squamish chief and the role of the government is unfortunately a common one. In addition to Kitsilano, UBC has been an integral part of my life. Firstly, UBC is very close to home, a 10 minute drive from the house I was born in. Secondly, as a student at UBC and finally as a staff at UBC. When reflecting on my life, I realize that I'm connected to the Musqueam people in many ways, and I understand that I've been the beneficiary of lands that never belonged to me. I've benefited from the crisp air of the UBC forest, brisk walks of the trails that extend through them, and cold water from the seas that bank our beaches. Unfortunately, sorry, until recently, I have not given my full appreciation for the land that I inhabit and the people whose sacrifice has been my bounty. I must respect, consider, and reflect on the history that exists here. In sharing my beginnings, I invite all of you to consider your roots and acknowledge the land you occupy today. Thank you so much, and I'll pass it over to Sabrina. Thank you for our land acknowledgement. So it's great to be here live on Facebook and YouTube for this special week of DWF Live. I'm Sabrina Ashknub from Bearskin Lake, Ontario in Treaty 9 uh, territory. And I am joining you live from Toronto. I am the Education Programs Assistant here at the Gord Downey and Cheney Wenjack Fund and super excited to be interviewing Courtney Montour. So inspired by Cheney's story and Gord's call to build a better Canada, the Gord Downey and Cheney Wenjack Fund aims to build a cultural understanding and create a path towards reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. DWF's work centers around improving the lives of Indigenous people by building awareness, education, connections between all people. Secret Path Week runs from October 17th to the second to the 22nd and marks the date that uh, Gord Downey and Cheney Wenjack joined the spirit world. We call on people in the land that we call Canada to use Secret Path Week to answer Gord Downey's call to action to do something. This can be done by recreating or by um, by creating reconciliation actions and furthering the conversation about the history of residential schools. So as you're tuning in, let us know where you are and uh, be sure to ask some questions in the chat because we will be doing a Q&A later on in this live. So, um, Again, we are excited to have Courtney, Courtney Montour, and Courtney Montour is a is Genewahaga from Kanawege. <laughs> she works in the documentary film and digital media fields, exploring issues of Indigenous identity. She directed, wrote, and co-produced Flat Rocks in 2017 a short documentary revealing how the development of Canada's St. Lawrence Seaway forever changed the landscape and livelihood of the Genewege Moha community. Her first documentary, Sex, Spirit, Strength, won Best of Festival and the Emerging Filmmaker Award uh, at the 2016 Yorkton Film Festival. She has directed episodes for several documentary series, including Mohawk Ironworkers in 2016 and Skin Indigenous in 2021. Courtney co-created and coordinated uh, McGill's University's Indigenous Field Studies course held in Kenawaga, Kenawahaga, <laughs> um, no, Kenawege, there we go, for eight years. <laughs> Passionate about education, 
on educating the course surfaces the intergenerational effects of colonization and Canadian policies on contemporary Indigenous society. And with that, I'm happy to introduce Courtney Montour. Hi, everyone. Niawa for having me. It's great to be here. Um, as uh, Sabrina mentioned, um, my name is Courtney Mentor. I'm a Ganyagahaga filmmaker from Ganawage, uh, which is just outside of Montreal. And I work in documentary film. So that means that um, you know, I, I write, I direct, I produce. And for me, it was really important to bring our stories to the screen. Um, as an Indigenous woman, an Indigenous person, um, you know, we're, we're storytellers uh, in our communities. And so it's really amazing to see that we can bring that to the screen for people across the country to be able to see. And that that's a way to make a difference as well, to share our stories, to share our perspectives. And so that's what got me into the documentary and film world. And I have a, a current project that came out last year called Mary 2X Early, I Am Indian Again. And that's something that I want to share uh, the trailer for so that we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, so Jamie, if you could please share the trailer. I had a vision that I one day would be free again to be an Indian. I married a white man in 1938, and yet there's that law that you're not Indian anymore when you marry an, an Indian. We lose our right to vote here, we lose our property. Our numbers will shrink and shrink and shrink, and really it's about our extinction. <laughs> So then I said, we've got to do something. Imagine, Mary, these recordings have gone untouched for over 30 years. This is the first time we have ever been able to speak. We demand that the Indian Act be changed to give us equal rights. You and your sisters, in a sense you're equal when you think you're equal. And if you think you're unequal, the law won't change much. A law can make your own brother discriminate against you, like he's Indian and you're not. My mother became notorious. That's when she started getting the death threats. You have to know the politicians. Oh, God. Politics. It's wicked. Please search your hearts and minds. Set my sisters free. Set my sisters free. So some of you may have had the chance to see the documentary already, uh, but for me, it was one that was really special and really important for me to make. Uh, Mary Tuax Early was from the same community as me. She was Ganyagahaga from Ganawage. And to me, she's somebody who is a historical figure in this country. She challenged Canada, the Canadian government, um, and Canadian policy uh, that discriminated Indigenous women, First Nations women, who had married non-Indian men. Uh, because in, in the Indian Act, um, Indian status is all determined by the Canadian government. And there was a law that if, if First Nations women married someone non-Indian, they lost their status and they had to leave their community and they no longer had you know, rights um, on that land. And so she's one of the women who fought really, really hard to make that change. And to me, that's, that's so important. That's a really important part of our history. And she was also somebody who was heavily involved in the women's rights movement in this country. So again, for me, it's always, why aren't these stories that present uh, in our schools, in the history books. And that's why I want to bring her story to the screen. Uh, it's so important to uplift um, 
you know, our indigenous stories and especially the stories and the work of our indigenous women. So to see, uh, to see that and to honor that was the most important thing for me to bring, to bring her story out. And with the film, it's a way to show how you can make change. Um, it's exciting to see now that people across the country are starting to know Mary Tuax early. Um, for those of you that know Google, Google does a doodle on their homepage um, to recognize uh, people who've made you know a difference, and they did one on Mary last uh, last year, last June. So that was a huge. Uh, acknowledgement of her work to see that again across the country and that recognition. Um, so for me, that's that's always important. And Mary to me is such a, a role model um, that we can all, you know, look toward. Uh, she's somebody who worked years, she worked over two decades to challenge those laws and to have to take that up with the Canadian government and to travel to Ottawa all the time to talk with the media and journalists. And you have to think, you know, doing that for 20 years, that takes a lot of patience and that's a lot of persistence. And so that's something that we could all learn from as well. You know, the way to, to lead with love and care and that each one of you have the possibility to make a difference like she did. It's something she started. Um, she didn't have, she didn't come from that kind of educational background. Um, you know, she didn't work in politics, uh, but she, she went into that space and it was something that she cared about and was able to make change. So again, it's something that I think everyone can learn from and how they can make change, you know, in your own community, um, in your own school, if you find support and there's uh, an issue that's really important to, to you and your heart. So that's another thing I think is very important about um, Mary's story. And again, it's also um, her story is one that helps create an understanding of what Indian status means in this country and the fact that it's something that the Canadian government decides. And so, you know, even though we've had so much change from people like Mary Tuax Early and other women, um, the film also brings awareness that there's still lots of work to do, that there's still many women uh, and families who still are waiting to be accepted and to get their Indian status by the Canadian government. And so in the meantime, you know, that means that people can't live in their community, they can't be involved in uh, politics, in, in decisions about, uh, you know, land rights, fishing, hunting. Um, so it, it's, really, it's really key to being able to be included in community and that's something that's very important as well and that many of our women still continue to work on so those are all um, the elements that i thought were really special about making that film and for me when i do um, all of my work in documentaries the most important thing to me is collaboration um you know because historically many people would do you'd say a helicopter approach. You know, they come in, they'll take our stories, take our photos and leave. And now that we have indigenous people working in these roles, we like to make sure that we're making those connections, that everybody who's involved has a voice and has a say. And that's something that's really important because when you're watching a movie, you should maybe ask yourself, you know, who who's making the movie? Whose perspective is this from? Uh, who's benefiting from the story that's being on the screen? And that applies to, you know, even social media uh, and, and the news to think about where it's coming from and, and who's telling the stories. 
And it really makes a difference as well, that collaboration with community, because it's always their voice uh, and their story that's going to carry on for years. And that's something that, that you want to honor as well. And the same thing can apply to, to school and uh, you know, projects that you're doing or assignments. So anytime that you're, you're connecting with people in your community, think about that and how they're, they're helping you and how can you help them too by, by the project that you're working on. So those are the kind of things that I think about um, when I'm creating and, and making films and how it's a real you know, honor to be able to share those stories and and work with our communities to get our point of view out there because our voices matter and and your voice matters and your story matters you all have a story and it's really important to to share that with others and you know i'd be happy to know uh sabrina if you if there's any questions hi courtney um, so we do have a couple of questions. So our first one is from, actually, I think we're going to go to one of our classrooms right now. We're going to go to Anne. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm actually an educator, but I, I don't have a class with me today. Um, but uh, I wanted to attend your session. Um, thank you so much for presenting. Um, I have watched Mary Two Acts early, and I think it's an excellent film. I'm, I'm wondering what your research process was like and how much time did you spend researching um, before actually going into production? Because uh, I, I imagine there was a lot of archives to go through. Yes. Um, and so, so this film, Married to Acts Early, uh, took four years to make. And a large part of that was the research because there actually wasn't that much out there. So when you see the movie now, it, it, it looks very complete, but there's not, there wasn't a lot um, of archives. And for me, that was, again, really telling, really troubling as well, it, it's a reminder of um, whose narrative, who's controlling the history and the stories that we hear in this country. Um, so it, it was very difficult. I was traveling to different places across Canada, going to like the Library and Archives Canada and Ottawa, um, going to Edmonton where a lot of the work happened uh, and a lot of the women that she worked with um, were in that area. Um, but there was very, very, very little. And even the archives, you know, they, they just didn't have it. Our national archives didn't have much. And our media, when, when I had specific dates, uh, you know, and going to the news or, or newspapers, and sometimes it was like, we, you know, we threw that away, we, we taped over it. And it's just unbelievable to, to think that, that these things weren't important. And so that it's a reminder of what responsibility it is um, for Indigenous storytellers, Indigenous researchers to make note of the things that they find and to, you know, to, to, to label them so that we have access to these stories because it, it wasn't an easy journey. And before the film, there was maybe three or four um, pictures uh, found online, and now there there's you know quite a few because of the the results of the film. And I just hope that more and more people come forward with with archives they have. Um, and part of that process was also doing a national call out. Uh, the film was produced by the National Film Board of Canada, so we did a, a blog and saying that I was making the movie and does, does anyone have uh, you know, ideas of where to look for, for archives? So some tips came in that way, but what really came in was uh, a flood of support from people who knew Mary, who worked alongside her, people who even met Mary just once, like 30 years ago, had wrote to me to share that experience. So again, it was something that just 
reassured how important her story was, how important this issue was, and and why the story needs to be told. That's that's amazing um, what you were able to do, considering so like how few archives there were of her of her story. So um, kudos for making such an incredible film with uh, with so so little. Um, I'm I'm wondering how. And sorry, I won't take up all of the the time for the questions, but I, I I was curious as to how the Google Doodle came to be because obviously that's huge in terms of the exposure and obviously the sharing of of Mary's story. Um, um, how did how did that come about? And how, like, were you involved in that? Yes. So it was something that that they Google had in their mind um, already. And they were working with uh, a Ganyagahaga artist, uh, Mohawk Star fr from Ganawage as well. And we, I had connected with, with Google over this um, and we collaborated together to, to do the doodle. Um, Star as the, the artist. And then they asked me to, to write the, the blog that goes with it. Um, we had a, a Ganyageha uh, translator from my community who also did it all in Mohawk. So it was nice to have this community collaboration to, again, uplift her story and bring it across Canada. That's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> that is, that's so, that's so great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I have other questions, but I'll let other people participate. So we're just going to go to another um, a comment in on our YouTube. So who have been some of your biggest inspiration in film and documentary? And also, specifically, I want to add Indigenous um, directors, filmmakers, anyone in the film industry. Yeah. I mean, again, there's, there's so many people now. And I'll, I'll mention a bunch of names. But one, of course, is Alanis Obamswin. Uh, she's an Abenaki filmmaker who has been making documentaries uh, for over 50 years. And she's really um, like one of the people who, you know, started Indigenous storytelling on the screen in this country at a time when people didn't want to hear our stories and didn't want to support the creation of Indigenous films. Um, so a complete inspiration to many of us who are, are working in the field today. Um, and she was a huge support on this project. Uh, Alanis had actually recorded Mary to Axe early uh, back in 1984 uh, in Mary's home in Ganawage. And those were audio recordings. And that was something that Alanis gifted to me. And it's really, it's really what weaves the whole story together uh, for those that haven't seen it yet. It, gives the opportunity for Mary to tell her own story. And it feels like we're sitting around the kitchen table with her uh, and it feels like she's here with us. So to me, that was really, again, really important that it's coming from Mary's perspective, um, telling her own story. And other filmmakers, uh, there's Elmaya Tailfeathers, who's a fantastic mm -hmm. filmmaker, uh, Tasha Hubbard, um, Alex Zarowicz, um, Trevor Solway, like there's just, we just have so many now across the country that it, it's great to, to have this access and this community where we all support one another. Yeah, I feel like the, um, the Indigenous film industry is pretty well connected. Like I, I know a, a few people in it and they, I feel like they're all just like work together or like help each other out. And it just seems like a very, um, loving community to be a part of. So another one, um, what are some of the topics you have explored in your documentary filmmaking throughout your career? Yeah, so for me, again, it always centers around identity and I'll find different pathways to do that. Um, I'm trying to think now, for example, I, sometimes I do documentary series, so Skindigenous, uh, is on indigenous tattooing practices around the world. But again, to me, that's that's so tied to community culture and who you are. 
Um, I just had the chance to work on a really beautiful series, Pulse, um, that's airing on APTN now. They're in their, their third week uh, tonight, this, this Friday. Um, and that's that follows um, a different indigenous dancer in each episode and in their home life and also them performing. And again, it's just incredible to see the diversity of talents. And we have people in ballet, burlesque, contemporary dance, traditional dances. Um, but again, it, to me, it all goes back to identity. They're, they're expressing themselves and, and their culture th through those dances. Um, I'm working on a, a Mi'kmaq fishery show uh, out east, uh, Gespegawagi, the last land. Um, again, identity, it's all, it's all tied to fishing rights and, and that connection to culture. Yeah. Um, so I, there's, a, there's a wide variety, like you had mentioned earlier, Mohawk iron workers. It was something special for my community because our iron workers are known you know across the world for for their steel work on many buildings including many buildings in new york city mm -hmm. uh and how we've contributed to that and many people are still doing that work today and now we have women working in that field so that's something that uh again is 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 very connected and very something of pride for for our iron workers yeah for sure and um, another one. So what advice do you have for Indigenous youth who want to get into film? Yeah, I'd say, you know, reach out. Uh, you can reach out to me. There's, there's people, uh, there's Indigenous filmmakers now across the country. There's always someone somewhere that can help mentor you uh, to, to start out. Um, and of course, you can go the path of, you know, after you graduate high school to go into a film program uh, in a college or university. Um, you know, even if you're you're still in high school, I'm sure there's programs in your school or after after school programs. Just pick up your phone and go outside and start recording things uh, and try different things out. You know, now with social media, there's so many amazing videos happening on TikTok and you know, all these different platforms, you can just see, you know, all of the, there, there's so much storytelling skills and ability that you already have. So again, it's, it's just making those connections. And I know I'd be happy to assist with that. And that was the most important thing for me was that mentorship. When I started out, I didn't know that I, I wanted to be a filmmaker. It was someone who had suggested uh, a Cree company in Montreal that was hiring indigenous peoples to try out everything. So I had a chance to do uh, sound on some films, production management, directing, and that's where I, I fell in love with it and realized that our stories matter, that this is a place where I can make a difference. Um, and that was the most important th thing for me was that, that mentorship. So I think that's what really counts, to learn hands-on and to have people who are gonna support you in that. Yeah, and uh, you've really been everywhere in the, <laughs> behind the scenes, haven't you? <laughs> like so doing sound, like holding like a boom mic or pretty sure that's what they're called. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's totally like, we are storytellers. Everyone, we are naturally born storytellers. We, that's who we are as people. So I, I think it's absolutely beautiful that you are doing that and sharing more knowledge just, and also just because yes, the uh, indigenous film industry is blowing up like crazy. There's people everywhere. Most likely if somebody is trying to get into the film industry, you just ask somebody that you know, and then they'll probably know somebody or yeah. like there's definitely a lot of um, avenues that somebody can uh, find a way to get into the film industry. And it's just about asking and having conversations and sharing interest for sure. Yeah. So we're going to go to um, Keenan. We're going to ask this uh, last question and then we're going to see if Anne has any more questions. So what keeps you motivated and inspire, inspired? 
Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's the connection to our stories and getting to travel across this country and learn about and learn from our other communities. Uh, to me, it's, it's sometimes that, you know, I have to pinch myself that this is, this is what I get to do. That's where I find my inspiration is that I'm continuously learning on this journey of filmmaking. And then I get to share that back with the wider audience on the screen. So it's, I, I just, it's a dream for me. That's awesome. And you probably see just all across Turtle Island, just the beauty of it all. So that well, definitely. People, are, people yeah. are welcoming us, you know, into our homes, into their lives to share a bit of that with us. So that's really an honor. And again, something mm -hmm. to, to respect that relationship and, and what people are sharing with me. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's definitely like a close look into who they are and how their community works, how their home works. Like it's, so it's definitely an honor and something that I pro would definitely hold dear to my heart. <laughs> and I know you probably do as well. <laughs> Yeah. So let's go to Ed and see if she has any more questions. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question in regards to your practice. Um, what has what has been kind of some of the biggest challenges for you as a filmmaker, and what kind of advice would you give to young filmmakers to uh, overcome some of these challenges? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think now. What that's a great question. Um, I think. Well, one of the things in, in an indus film industry is is time. I think everyone feels rushed or the pressure that there's, there's a deadline. And deadlines are important. <laughs> they keep you on track. <laughs> That's a good thing. But uh, a lot of us in the industry um, are also trying to slow things down. Because, again, it's that connection to community, connecting to the participants, so I think that's one of the most important things is when you're sitting with somebody, uh, again, this could be for a project for school. If you're sitting with someone and talking with someone, just take the time to sit and listen to them. And I think that's one of the most important things. They'll tell you what's what's important to them um, and, and not to rush that. And uh, you might have a schedule in mind. And that's something that we have to do a lot of in documentary. You you write everything out beforehand, uh, but to know that that can always change. And if on that day, you know, the, this participant or someone that you're going to see has something else in mind, be able to adapt and also to go with the flow. Those are, I think, key things when starting out that, that you have to take time with things. That's that's great advice. And um, what are you working on now? Uh, now is uh, Guest Begawagi, The Last Land, the Mi'kmaq fishery show. I'm uh, editing away some some episodes for that, three episodes for season two, and uh, actually working with them, um, collaborating with Maori Land Film Festival, which is in New Zealand. Uh, and we're doing some filmmaking workshop initiatives in Ganawage next week. Uh, so a cultural learning exchange um, that centers, you know, our community and in Indigenous approaches to teaching and learning. And then we're going to have a whole delegation uh, go to Maori land in March. And so for me, that's always important to, again, collaborate with community. I'm always trying to create pathways um, in communities so that people can storytell for those that want to, you know, see what it's like to work in the industry to, to try those things out in community. Because I think it's important that that you, you shouldn't have to go and leave your community and go to an urban center to be able to storytell. And so that's, that's important to create, to create that learning uh, at the community. That sounds amazing and all the best. I, I can't wait to see your next projects. Yeah. Well. For sure. That sounds super exciting um, about um, 
Maori land, like New Zealand. <laughs> it definitely is a beautiful country. And I um, actually study there about um, biculturalism and sustainability. So I can definitely tell um, it's, it's very beautiful. <laughs> and um, yeah, and like their culture there, I got to spend some time on uh, Marae and it was incredible. Um, and just like get, I got to know the history uh, behind that certain Marae and I loved it. So <laughs> definitely excited to see that and, uh, and for your upcoming project. But um, we're gonna actually close out here and um, thank you for joining us today, uh, Courtney. And thank you to our youth ambassador, Justina, for doing our lot acknowledgement. So as I mentioned before, we have been broadcasting live every day this week as a part of Secret Path Week. Uh, you can learn more about Secret Path Week and watch our DWF live sessions by visiting our website, dannywenjack.ca forward slash DWF live. We have a short survey that will be dropped in the chat below. Uh, please let us know what you thought of today's program and what you would like to see in a future DWF live sessions. Um, if you enjoyed our broadcast, feel free to share it with your friends and family and be sure to watch it with somebody. Share it, uh, talk about it, discuss the important uh, conversations we had throughout this week. Um, so again, thank you to all of our speakers and to all of our classrooms that joined us. Thank you for all of your comments. So this now wraps up DWF Live for Secret Path Week 2022. Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful day.